Hi. Hi. Yay. You can hear me and everything, right? Oh, it's perfect. Yeah. I'm so excited to meet you. Yeah, you're awesome. Um, oh, I'm a happy guy. <laughs> me too. I'm a happy girl. I understand. Yeah, that makes it all work very well then for me. Yeah. So um, I'm in Europe right now, but I'm in the process of writing my second book. And yeah. I want to apply everything you've done in your life. I mean, not just your stuff, but other things to women in their pregnancy. And nobody knows. Yeah. And nobody knows the level that they need to know. And so I am hoping, I, I know as far as I know, so my background's in psychology and, and, and nurse practitioner and nursing, and I worked in labor and delivery. So I really want to apply everything and so much more of how to create this enlightened child. And that's my yeah. destiny. And that's my, my entire life's work will be this just for the pregnancy period. Yes. So I'd love to start with preconception. So, you know, I know a lot, but I know you know a lot more about, you know, what is there anything I'm missing with studies or anything that, you know, the people and women really, really need to get out there about specific foods they should and should not eat? I mean, I know some, but like, is there any research or data that you've heard of, uh, you know, going into deeper into, you know, things that really affect the genes with food and then about getting rid of the belief systems and the subconscious and working on yourself before you actually get pregnant for the mother and the father. This is uh, why uh, uh, cultures, uh, other than this Western culture that we're in, uh, always had a period of um, uh, the, of the pre-pregnancy uh, period uh, to get their consciousness to accommodate this coming baby. They, uh, and it's part of it is uh, associated with something called genomic imprinting. And mm. genomic imprinting is a very serious uh, insight into uh, founding the, the fate of a child, the, the imprints that it gets before fertilization. This is so a beautiful. Tell me more about that. Is there authors or any books on that that I could do more research for the text I'm creating? See, that's what I'm trying to create in our culture right now, which is not in the Western culture. That's what I want to create with mystical motherhood is exactly that. What are the cultures that have... It's important, what are, there, it's important because there is a biological correlate to go with all this. So it's not an accident or suggestion. It's like, no, this is a mechanism. You have to understand this mechanism is very, very important. And how long was this... How long did they prepare for? What were the details of it and what kind of things did they do? Do you know? I can't tell you, but it was something in a matter of a couple of weeks or more or something. It was a period of really um, uh, honoring the future child by, by, you know, creating a better consciousness is basically what it was all about. Okay. Clearing consciousness uh, for this child, which is uh, involved with changing the imprinting of this child, which I, uh, genomic imprinting, that's a special, the special terminology. So we can talk about that. The genomic imprinting is um, epigenetics. <laughs> okay, there are genes and there are genetics. And then there's something called epigenetics. And epigenetics is the, the, um, the science of how consciousness and environment are shaping the genetic readout of an individual. Yes. Uh, significance, for example, is identical twins will come essentially with the identical set of genes, and yet one could die of cancer and the other could live to 100 with no problem at all, and all of a 
sudden it says, well, then there was something other than genes that are shaping this future, and that's the epigenetic imprinting. Right. And ep- epigenetic. So, in other words, you get your genes, but then epigenetics modifies the readout of the genes for that individual. Mm-hmm. So, if, to be a mother, you've already modified your genes from the time you were an infant to this point. Uh, and in creating an egg, one of the important things is to uh, remove any imprint, epigenetic imprint, so like a fresh, clean start with the genes. Exactly. Okay? But there's a, in the weeks just before fertilization, in other words, an egg is maturing, and within the first couple of weeks before that, fertil- that egg will be ovulated, um, it's open to some genetic imprinting, meaning how the mother is experiencing life at this moment, even before the fertilization, she, she's impacting the fate by selecting certain genes in her egg, imprinting them. Mm. And the same thing occurs with the sperm. So it says, at some level, what's the point? The point is this. Uh, sperm and eggs are created, let's say eggs, for example. A woman is born with all her eggs. The, the moment she's born, she's got all her eggs all ready for the future, okay? Uh, but the point about that simply is, um, oh, wait, we're into 10 o'clock already. We should be, we should be doing a, a, a recording. Or we're recording. Yeah. Yeah, no, I it's easy for me. No, no. This is I just I'm really getting information for my next book. And oh, okay. so, so this is not a recording for an audience. Um it is eventually. Yeah, it's not but it's not like it's, you know, the mothers I work with and the okay. and the and the women that need to hear your information. So this is really just for conscious mothers that want to do it differently. Oh, absolutely. So yeah. the point that I was getting at was simply this. Genetics Genetics are the genes that we get, the blueprints, okay? A gene is a blueprint to make a protein. That's all it is. Mm-hmm. I say, well, why is that relevant? Well, the proteins give us the characteristic body that we have. Uh, it, what you see is a protein m- machine, and there are 100,000 different proteins that assemble to create this human body. Each cell is made out of proteins as a building block, and the relevance about that is that uh, the genes are the blueprints to make these proteins. Now, the important information that we recognize now, number one is the belief that genes turn on and off is completely false. A gene does not turn on and off. A gene does not even control its own expression. A gene is a blueprint. And I really, I mean, let's emphasize the point of this by saying you walk into a, an architect's office and she's working on a blueprint, uh, and you ask her, is your blueprint on or off? And, and of course, she'll look at you like, what are you talking about? There's no on and off. It's a blueprint. I go, this, this is exactly right. A gene is a blueprint. It doesn't have on and off. It doesn't control itself. It doesn't even know what the hell it is. I mean, we talk about genes like they're having this intelligence. It's like, no, genes are blueprints. As much intelligence as is in a blueprint is what's in a gene. Right. And I go, so this becomes relevant because then the whole belief that people walk away with that genes are controlling their life is a completely false statement. We are the contractors. Our consciousness and the environment that we live in represent contractors that pull up the gene blueprints that we need and can modify the gene blueprints that we need so that a single gene, remember a gene is a blueprint to make a protein? Mm -hmm. By environmental influences, I can create over 3,000 different proteins from every gene just based on how I perceive the world. And these are adjusting the readout, okay? Mm -hmm. It doesn't change the genetic code. It adjusts the readout. So you were born with a set of genes, uh, uh, and every day of life, your life experiences are altering which genes are going to be read and how they're going to be read. That's epigenetics. So when I said old-fashioned language, genetic control, this character is under genetic control. Mm -hmm. What I'm literally saying, uh, the gene control this character so when people compare the genes to the dimmer switch is and you say on or off is the dimmer switch more is that even an accurate uh way of no, putting no, it that, that might just say how much or how little uh, that's not what it is it's actually uh you rewrite you rewrite the the outcome of that gene here's a gene that's a blueprint it's like a a, a linear like on a, on a tape right and it, Hundred thousand years ago, there was something called ticker tape. <laughs> yeah, uh, and it was a machine where a message was printed on a long tape, and so all the letters 
words were written uh, uh, along the length of the tape. A gene is the equivalent of that. It's a linear uh, strip of sequence of letters that determine the structure of the protein. So it's a blueprint to make a protein. Okay. I say, yeah. And I make a copy of that. So that's one of the old story in school where you went from DNA goes to RNA goes to protein. That's the sequence of information. Mm -hmm. DNA is the original gene blueprint. RNA is like a Xerox copy of the gene. Okay. And that RNA is the actual physical blueprint upon which a protein is made. So the RNA is a copy of the gene that is used to make the protein. Ah, but it's, remember, it's a long strip like this. I say, right. Yeah, if I take a pair of scissors and tape, I can cut that that message into different sequences and tape them together in a different way. That's what epigenetics is all about. So epigenetics is, a, epi means above. When I say, what's the name of skin? Epidermis. Epidermis, like, yeah. What does that mean? It means above the dermis. That's a low, lower layer in the skin. The lower layer is dermis. Epidermis is the top, Okay. When I say epigenetics, what I'm saying is control above the genes, epi above. Mm -hmm. So uh, I say, well, what, what's above the genes that controls? I go consciousness, mm -hmm. how we perceive the world. Mm -hmm. I say, well, how we perceive the world is going to be using tape and scissors and cut the message up to make the protein that I need to fit the world that I see. So I adjust my biology based on my life experiences. So, for example, as I mentioned, identical twins. At the moment they're born, you do a genetic readout, they're almost exactly the same. But you come back one year later, five years, 10, 20 years later, and every year of life, the genetic readout of the twins will diverge based on their personal life experiences. And that's why one of the identical twins could die of cancer because mm -hmm. of those life experiences that that person had versus the other twin live 100 years healthfully all the way through, I say, yeah, but they both have the same genes. Say, yeah, I know, but I can modify the genes. I don't care what genes you came with. You can modify them and create 3,000 different variations. So uh, the relevance about disease is a very important point because in our conventional world of science, we uh, associate disease with genes. Oh, cancers, uh, genes, uh, heart, heart attack condition, genes did this. Uh, right. Uh, Diabetes, genes did this. I got to wait, 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 wait. All of those, th less, this is a fact. Less than 1% of disease is connected to genes. Mm. Fact. Mm. That, and that becomes, once we own that fact, I say, well, that's a fact, then where the heck is 90 plus percent of disease coming from? It's not coming from the genes. Right. I, I said, where's it coming from? Consciousness. Why? Epigenetics, consciousness is controlling not which genes are read, but how those genes are read. As I said, I can make 3,000 variations. I mean, I can come with a very healthy gene and through my life experiences create cancer. Mm. Not that I had, there's no cancer gene in the first place. That's a, a whole story in itself. The, uh, there are two words that biology has mixed up in describing this to the public, and the public walks away interchangeably using these two words when they're, they're, they're two separate words. One is called causation and the other is called correlation. Mm -hmm. I say, what's the difference? Causation means the act or agency which causes something to occur. Correlation means something is connected with something else. Okay? Mm -hmm. When we talk about cancer genes, there is no gene that causes cancer. Fact of life. This is 100% fact of life. There's no gene. You got that gene? You got cancer? No. You say, well, what about cancer genes like the BRCA1 gene? I go, 50% of the women have that gene, never get the cancer. Mm. Most important thing you have to understand from that conclusion right away, possession of the gene is not causing the cancer. Mm -hmm. You can have the gene, you never get the cancer. So gene is correlated with cancer, but does not cause cancer. What I say is it correlated with lifestyle. You got a lifestyle that's not in harmony, that gene will probably lead to cancer. You got a lifestyle that's in love and harmony and peace, that gene will never cause cancer, or not cause, will never lead to a cancer. And all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, I keep trying to adjust the genes. I go, no, don't adjust the genes. First, adjust the mind. That's the one that's adjusting the genes. 
So in the, in the, I want to go back to like, take it step by step through the process of, okay, so fertilization and at the moment of conception and that window of time you're speaking about, because I've actually never put it, I've never heard it about, I've never heard about, you know, the, the, the window of time being something that you were discussing. Could you tell us what, what could women do in that window of time that's very, very sacred and, and how would, what would you tell your daughter to do? into your life and harmony into your life uh, you, whether you're having a child or not that's a destination <laughs> but if you're having a child and you're not there then that's really the necessity to do is create a destination why i'll tell you why very simply when eggs are created as i said uh, eggs are already present in the girl the moment she's born she's got all the eggs for her lifetime okay? right and i say well why is this relevant i can say this for well, she wouldn't use any of those eggs, eggs for, you know, maybe 20 years at least, you know. Uh, and I go, well, why is this a problem? I say, because what is today's world about? And what will the world be in 20 years? I say, well, I don't know what the world's going to be in 20 years. So here's the point. I can't program a child when a girl is just born that will actually be created 20 years later. So basically it says what? Nature doesn't determine the full character of a baby until just before conception, mm. because this is now the light. This is now what's happening. The baby's going to be born now in the next nine months. It's going to be in this world as we see it right now. So whatever happened 20 years ago, that's not relevant. It's what's relevant is what's happening now. So nature has created a situation where it allows the programming of a child to be finalized at the time of fertilization and development in utero because at that point the child is being created to complement the environment and i said well wait the egg can't complement the environment doesn't even see the environment how do i know what the hell the environment is i go going back to the story of when i was in medical school and we would teach women that uh, all you needed to do was eat well supplements vitamins exercise yeah it's not true great, great nutrition because the story then was genes are going to unfold just the way they're going to unfold. You have nothing to do with it. That was old genetics. Epigenetics is no environment is changing the genes dynamically. So I say, yeah, but how does the fetus even know what the heck is going on in the environment? Mm -hmm. I go, ah, because as the mother's blood comes into the placenta, not only is it bringing in nutrition, but it's bringing in all the emotional chemicals, the growth hormones, the regulators of her biology experiencing her world and so if she's in a peaceful world then the biology of her blood will will have you know things supporting growth and health and all that kind of stuff if she comes from a, a world where there's no support whether it's a war-torn world or a world with a lot of violence in it and stuff like that uh then the, the, she's going to change the chemistry of her blood and that it's going to reflect and complement what's going on in her world so mm -hmm. the fetus can't see the world directly, but it is getting all of the communications that the mother's body is getting to get her body organized to live in the world. So the baby is being pre-programmed to live in the world via the mother's perception of the world. And I go, well, what about the father? And I go, well, of course, he makes a hell of a difference. Why? If the mother's happy, then the fetus is going to get happy signals. The father screws up then the mother's not happy, then the baby's going to get crummy signals. And all of a sudden you start to say, well, wait, then the attitude of the mother is not just her attitude, but it's connected to the father and the environment, of course. And, and this is what's going to prepare the fetus to survive in the world that it's going to be born into. So um, here, here's an interesting story, just on fetal development. The blood going into the placenta is nourishing the fetus. Whatever tissues and organs get more blood, get more development. And there are some organs and tissues that may not get that much blood. They're all based on what you remember I said, the mother's vascular system, how she's responding to the world is going to relate how the child's going to respond to the world. I say well, relevance is simply this. If a mother is under stress and she's activating what is called the HPA axis, that's yep. the, the adrenal axis, that's fight or flight, okay? And I say, why is it relevant? If the world is peaceful, 
and she's sending peaceful chemistry to her fetus as it's developing. It's going to develop a wholeness of the health. The gut is going to develop. The forebrain is going to develop because it gets a lot of blood going to the forebrain, and the gut gets a lot of blood to create the organs uh, to build the system up. But I say, if she all of a sudden finds herself in a threatening world and she starts releasing stress hormones into her body to get her ready to respond to the world, the stress hormones also cross into the placenta, which gets the fetus body ready. I say, yeah, well, here's the difference. In growth, the blood is concentrated in the viscera, the gut, which is what? Maintenance and development and taking, building the body, all that kind of stuff. And in the brain, the blood is mainly in the forebrain region, developing a conscious brain, okay? Mm -hmm. But if the woman is under stress and she's getting ready for fight or flight, where's the blood going in her body? And I say, well, for fight or flight, it's not the viscera that's important, it's the arms and legs. Yeah. <laughs> you got to fight or flight, you got to use these guys. So guess what? When stress hormones are released into the body, her blood goes from her gut to her arms and legs to get ready for fight or flight. So it says, why maintain the body if you're running away from a saber-toothed tiger? Right, right. So right. You, shut off, you shut off the blood flow to the gut or reduce them and put more blood flow to the muscles because that's what you're going to need to get the heck out of the way. Mm. And I say, and what about the brain? They go, oh, when you're in stress, you don't use thinking. That's very slow. You use hind brain. Mm -hmm. Hind brain is reflex and reaction. So I say, okay, stress hormones go to the mother puts the blood from the gut to the arms and legs so she can get ready to run and get all that. It takes, it shuts the blood down. The stress hormones shut the blood down in the forebrain and push the blood to the hindbrain because in, in a response like that, thinking is too slow. You want reaction, reflex, boom, boom. I go, oh, that's hindbrain. Mm -hmm. Thinking, forebrain, reaction, hindbrain. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I say, oh, so her blood is now going from, instead of forebrain, it's going to the hindbrain and to the muscles. I say, now, when that same set of hormones, that cocktail of stress, goes into the placenta, it shifts the blood flow in the placenta the same way. Yeah, it so does. The, the fetus gets more blood to the arms and legs. I go, yeah, because we're making a street fighter, because if it's a war out there, I don't want a brainiac kid. I need a kid that can defend himself to survive. So nature takes the mother's perception of a stressful world, takes the hormones of that, pushes it in the placenta, just like it went to her body, causes the blood to do the same thing. Go from the gut to the arms and legs. I say, what are you creating? I say, a muscular kid. Mm. Big skeleton, big muscle, big bone. I go, this is great if there's a war out there because that's what's going to help the kid survive. Also, the intelligence of the child gets compromised. Why? Because rather than nourishing the conscious brain, under stress, the blood vessels in the forebrain constrict push the blood to the hindbrain, so the forebrain in a stressed child is much less developed, and the hindbrain is greatly developed, but the hindbrain is what coordinates all the muscles, so... That it needs to be more developed. I have a quick question about that. Like if So can we transfer that to, to energetics? So if a woman's, you know, energy, energy center, you know, is inner power, like inner power, or down maybe in her state fight or flight, which would be, you know, safety, am I safe? Or if it's in the heart, what do you think that if you're focusing your energy within your heart, that energy is also going to be transferred within the child and created the same type of energy centers? If we're going to, you know, something more spiritual and consciousness, do you think that that child inside will also get amplified energy centers in the same way? Absolutely. It's a complement to what the mother's experiencing. So the mother is nature's head start program. Nature... The baby has no idea what the world's all about, but the mother is the one that's reading it, interpreting it, and responding to it. Mm -hmm. So she's already broadcasting via the composition of her blood how she's experiencing the world and what she needs to survive, whatever systems are amplified in that status. In the fetus, those systems are also amplified. So if she's coming from a heart in love, now that's a whole different, the chemistry of love is not the chemistry of stress. As a yeah. Percent and, and so a child in love will have a bigger brain development. In fact, a stressed mother, listen to this, because of her closing the blood vessels down in her forebrain and pushing her to reflex, and causes the fetus to cut the blood vessels down the forebrain, pushes the hindbrain, and blood causes that to develop. But it could lose 52% of a child's intelligence. Yeah, I believe it. And be compromised. 
because the blood is going to the hindbrain. But if the, a street fighter is what's going to survive, well, then that child's got a good chance of living if there's a war outside. Yeah. Okay? But if there's no war outside, but the mother perceives there's one, what does the fetus know? This fetus is, it perceives what the mother perceives. She feels that life is a struggle, then that stress is going to go pass on to her child, even, you know, as it's developing. So, okay. Yeah, so uh, the simple conclusion is this. Uh, parents are genetic engineers. They're changing the genetic readout of their fetus to accommodate their relationship to their world so that the fetus will respond when it's born to the world that the parents are perceiving. So it's almost like if you, if so first question, two questions here. When does that window start? Um, because I mean, I start with women like nine months before, really, about a year before I work with them to clear themselves energetically and all these mentally, spiritually, physically. So when do you think that critical window before conception really, really counts for the genetics? Minimum two months. About two months is when the, the egg that will be ovulated in two months is now getting uh, imprinted. Two months, okay. About two months before is when the genes are, because there's certain genes that the mother sees that are going to help this fetus. There's certain genes that the father needs to activate to, to experience his life. So you're getting a paternal set of genes and a maternal set of genes of imprinting, and usually they're quite different. The paternal genes enhance the physical body, the bones, muscles, and all that stuff. The maternal genes uh, are really more for the vegetative and intellectual fun functions, okay? Okay. Because um, there's a division of labor. Uh, uh, er every person has uh, a visceral area, which is the gut with all the organs, which are what? maintenance and building the body, vegetation, taking care of the system, that, that's, uh, that and intelligence is connected to the feminine aspect of a body. A body has both masculine and feminine. Right. Okay. The masculine part is not the viscera, but it's the arms and the legs uh, and the hindbrain that are really the more important one because that's the, the, the role of the musculoskeletal system is support and protection. The role of the gut is maintenance and growth and development, okay? And, and so the idea is you need both of these to, to work together. But if the world requires more protection, then you're going to amplify the, the male aspect of the body. If the world is safe and sound, then you're going to amplify the feminine aspect of the body, okay? Uh, and, and it's interesting because men and women have differentiated on Men are based on the skeletal system and the muscular system. Yeah. Uh, very interesting point. In a silhouette, you can tell a male from a female. Right. Well, yeah, but what character? I say the male silhouette is shaped by the muscles. The female silhouette is shaped by the lipids. Lipids are energy. Lipids are creative juices in a sense of the, the resource to build. I mean, that's what, what, what adipose is all about. It's stored energy. Mm -hmm. Okay, women have a body determined by lipids because they're the vegetative energy using function of, of a woman. The male body is distinguished in a silhouette by its muscles, which are the uh, support and protection character. Okay. Would it be important right before conception, this is side note, to have the male be incredibly in shape to pass on those type of genes to the child? completely but every male and every female is a combination of both I, I i have testosterone and estrogen and you have estrogen and testosterone okay we're, we're, we're we have to share the same function within a single body right so which one do i want to emphasize which one do i want well i want health i want intelligence i go oh, that's what i'm trying to get then i have to de-emphasize protection because protection will bring up the skeletal muscle, the bite, the hindbrain, and all that, that street fighting stuff, okay? So basically it says, I look at the world and I say, what does it need? What, what do I need to do to stay alive in this world? If I see the world as supporting me and, and, and nice and happy and loving, then I'm willing to bring into the world a child that is going to be uh, living in, 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 in a resilient, 
resistance-free kind of environment, which gives you an opportunity to be more intelligent and healthier. Mm. And if uh, I see the world as a struggle, I'm going to have to change the direction of that fetus because it's like if it's going to survive, it has to really be able to handle the struggle. Uh, it's, you're, you're going to need this fight or flight stuff if you need it. But if you don't need it, building it up over the other stuff is, is a compromise to the child. So basically it says, does the world, is the world as scary as many people think it is? I go, well, this is you got to be careful about because if you're going to have a baby, you're going to create the physiology of the baby to match your vision of the world, not the real world. So you can actually trick your body. So like, could a woman do this? Let's say, okay, so let's say I have a group of women. I'm going to teach them of how to create this enlightened child. Even if their world isn't perfect, it's like it's almost like their consciousness could trick their environment or they can program themselves into believing that everything is and feeling that everything is amplified with this love or, you know, these these positive emotions. Is that possible? Or do you think... It, only through the reference of the mother. Only through the reference. And then I say, well, her reference is based on her belief system. I go, what? I'll give you an example. Uh, how powerful is the belief system in controlling? I go, placebo. <laughs> What's a placebo? Yeah. And I give you the drug, and you have a disease, and I tell you, this is the new miracle modern drug. You say, oh, wow, it is. You take the drug, and you get better, and then you find out it was a sugar pill. I say, then what heals you? Not the sugar pill. It was your belief. So what was the point? My belief is going to determine what's going on inside, not the real world. That could be anything going on out there. And then we also have to recognize, in addition to positive thinking, which is the placebo effect, and everyone is familiar with the results of positive thinking in that regard, I also need to emphasize very clearly that a negative thinking is equally powerful in shaping your biology but in the opposite direction from positive placebo thinking. Uh, Negative thinking is called nocebo thinking. And the relevance about that, every disease on this planet can be created just by the thought, not anything to do with the genes. Right. And all of a sudden I say, oh my God, you're creating. I go, yes, that's the whole idea about it. We're we're not victims of genes. We came out of the womb and all of a sudden my my life is pre-programmed. No, it's not. I can change the damn program anytime I want if I know how. But the reality is, I came with a program, and uh, and it's all based on what my parents, how their program, how how they programmed me, okay. Mm-hmm. And, and the idea is, uh, we become just like our parents, uh, not because of the genetics, but because of the programming. <laughs> That's really where, where we get the, the similarity, where somebody oh is just like his dad, or she's just like her mom. I go. It wasn't all genes that had to do that. It was basically you were programmed the same way your parent was was already programmed. They're programming you. So what we have to do is what you're doing is a very important job. What if I came in here with some bad programming? Because what the hell did my parents know? They were programmed by their parents. Right. Somebody's got to stop it. Somebody at some point. And so that's what I work on is with women is, is that you're the one, this gender, and it seems like every woman, it seems like more and more women are stepping up and saying there's got to be a different way of doing this. Absolutely. And, you're, and, and what you're doing is this. I have to, A, recognize I'm not controlled by my genes. I'm controlled by my perception of the environment. I say, why is it relevant? If I was controlled by my genes, I'd have to go change my genes. <laughs> and I go, no, no. This is the cool part. You don't have to change your genes. You just have to change your perception. Your perception is selecting the genes and modifying the readout of the genes to match your perception. And, and all of a sudden I say, oh my God, then I'm not an accident or a victim. I'm the creator. Except if I have no idea that I've been programmed, then I have no idea of how come my wishes and desires and my creative conscious mind don't manifest. I go, it's because... 95% of the day, your behavior isn't even controlled by conscious mind. It's controlled by subconscious sub- mind. Do, do you think that the time, um, I feel that the time in pregnancy is like the most critical point of motherhood and could actually completely change the planet because it's the critical time of like everything's programmed in pregnancy. Or do you think that after the child's born, because I haven't found a, a scientific theory that talks about consciousness in the womb yet. I mean, Freud, everybody starts at birth. 
nobody yeah. talk, talks about the womb. And so my, I feel like my part of my life's goal is to get the theory, you know, that this is the, this is part of, you know, or to get it in the medical, you know, get in the medical schools to teach the doctors that it's programming in the womb, not, do you think that's a... It, start, it starts in the last trimester of pregnancy. This is when, when the, uh, the child starts learning. And I say, how do you mean the child's learning? I say, look, play music to the, to the fetus through the abdominal wall in that third trimester and play that music. The moment the baby's born, you play that music, the baby will respond exactly to that music. Or if the father talks to the baby through the abdominal wall and has a continuous talking with the baby in that last trimester, the moment the baby is born and the father opens his, his mouth, the baby will know exactly which one the father is from that voice, okay? And I say, well, there's a meaning here. I go, yeah, of course there's a meaning. The baby is learning in that trimester. How do you think it, it knew who the father was or the music was? It had already learned it. I say, it's not even born. It learned it. I say, it learns more than that. It learns, it learns way more it. than that. It learns more than that because anything that's a repetitive pattern, rep repetition is the character in this case. You want to play the music? If you play music once through the abdominal wall, the baby is not going to learn that. If the father talks once, the baby's not going to learn that. It's repetition. So I go, ah, a mother's experiences that are based on repetition are acquired by the child. A mother that experiences an anomaly, something just happened, a uh, car accident, oh my God, no. I go, yeah, but that happened once. Uh, if it happens several times or more, that repetition is what leads to learning okay mm -hmm. so if a mother has a, a weird experience and it only happens once that, that's not the big deal but if she's repetitive in her pattern and plays the pattern over and over again then the child will be born with that so my story that i try to tell people is simply this i tell people that uh, uh behavior is like a song uh, a song has lyrics and a song has music and i say okay the baby learns the music. That's the emotional roller coaster that the mother is rep repeating over and over again. And, and so the baby is born with the music, no lyrics. It doesn't know what the mother's responding to per se, but it knows if it starts playing the music, it's going to play the music just like it learned from the mother. And if it's an addictive behavior, then the child will express an addictive behavior. But it doesn't have to be uh, uh, alcohol, drugs. It could be food. It could be sex. I don't you know, whatever it is that will play with the music. The lyrics are added after the child is born. The music is put into the child before it is born. And that's why the patterns are already established in utero. I mean, even food patterns, as we opened up with, even food patterns, uh, based on what the mother is eating, becomes a pattern that's acceptable to the fetus as well. Okay? Learn that. It learned every day. That's not an accident. It wasn't, that, oh, wow, just the baby likes just what the mother likes. It's like, that's not an accident. <laughs> right. That, that's the program. Do you, so is it, is it, so if like, this for some people they they don't understand this yet i do believe in the next 10 to 20 years they will but the thoughts every thought the woman has will be programming the child can you talk about that and the importance of like thought management okay well here why is thought important uh, i give you i'll go back very briefly about my own research okay uh i was cloning stem cells they're the equivalent of embryonic cells the multi-potential and they clone it by putting one cell in a petri dish and, and then it divides every 10 or 12 hours. So first there's one cell, then two, four, eight, doubling, doubling, doubling. A week later, 30,000 cells in the petri dish. Most important fact is this, all the cells are derived from the same parent. So I have 30,000 genetically identical cells, but I split those cells into three different petri dishes. So each dish, all the dishes have the same genetically identical cells, but I change the composition of the culture medium. That's what I grow cells in. You say, what is culture medium? I go, a laboratory version of blood. So if I grow human cells, I look at what are you, what is human blood got in it, and then I try to make culture medium using the same stuff. If I grow mouse cells, I look at what mouse blood's got in it and try and grow it. So culture medium is equivalent to blood. And I go, so what, what does this mean? I say, I have genetically identical cells in three petri dishes, but I changed some of the chemistry of the culture medium, the chemistry of the blood. And I say in one dish in version A uh, of the culture medium, I get muscle. 
in a second dish with genetically identical cells but a different version culture meaning they might get bone and in a third dish again with genetically identical cells but a different version of culture meaning they might get fat cells well the point is very critical what controlled the fate of the cells and the answer was they all had the same genes it was the composition of the culture meaning the blood so now I say so what the heck does it have to do with me as a human and I go this human is not a single entity. A human is made out of 50 trillion cells. The cells are the living entity. I have 50 trillion amoeba-like cells in my body. And I go, so when I say the word groups, that doesn't mean one person. That means one community of, of cells. Mm. So uh, the jokey part is uh, a, a human body is like a skin-covered Petri dish with 50 trillion cells inside. I go, yeah, and they have the original culture medium. Ah, the original culture medium is blood. And I go, yes. And what else does it mean? That the chemistry of the blood is going to control the genetics and the fate of the cells because that's what I showed in the Petri dish. It doesn't make a difference if the cell is in a skin covered dish or a plastic dish. The cell still is controlled by the composition of the culture medium, the blood. Now we're coming down to the final step. I say, you got 50 trillion cells in your body. And I say, yeah, and what should the genetics be of those cells? I go, what chemistry is in the culture medium? That will determine the fate of the cells, just like I did in the experiment. And I go, okay, now he goes, well, what? who creates the chemistry of the culture medium? I go, the blood is, the chemistry of the blood is created by the brain. Okay, okay, now the last big, big question. So what chemistry should the brain put into the blood? And then I go, whatever the picture in the mind is, that picture is translated with complementary chemistry. And so if it's a positive picture, I release positive chemistry. If it's a scary picture, I release negative chemistry. And all of a sudden I say, oh my God, then what picture am I holding in my mind? So for example, if I open my eyes and I see someone I love, I release dopamine for pleasure, oxytocin for bonding, vasopressin, uh, a hormone that makes me more attractive so my lover stays with me, and I release growth hormone. <laughs> what is growth hormone? Exactly what it says it is causes growth. And I say, so when a person's in love, the chemistry is of pleasure and bonding and health. I go, yeah, that's why when people are in love, you can say, oh, you can see how in love they are because they're glowing. I say, what's glowing? Health. Radiating. I say, why? The picture of love translates into chemistry that enhances vitality. Mm. So I say, well, the same person opens their eyes, but they see something that scares them. I go, oh, wait. The chemistry that goes in the blood now is not love chemistry. The chemistry in, in a scary situation is stress hormones and things that affect the immune system in a negative way. And I go, oh my God. So the chemistry of my blood changes whether I'm thinking about love or whether I'm experiencing fear. And I say, yeah, the chemistry changes, the blood changes. And what is that important for? Because it's controlling the cells to respond to, am I in love? Different behavior. Am I in fear? Different behavior. And all of a sudden I say, the chemistry, and I say the chemistry from the brain is controlled by that picture in my mind. And that's why your work then is so important is to say, you've got to clear this picture in your mind to eliminate those things that are not going to support growth. Stress, fear, issues of a toxic environment, whatever it is. Get, I got to clear this because if I'm ready to make a, a future embryo, then I'm going to make sure that my, my genetic activity, controlled by my chemistry, mm -hmm. is the genetic activity that promotes growth and harmony and health versus a, a, a stress chemistry, which is responsible for 90% of the illness on this planet. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when I start a baby off, don't start it off with stress chemistry that you've already compromised the ability of that child consciously and physiologically, you've compromised that child. This is incredible. You're really, really helping me picture out how I'm going to explain this to women in a, in a really easy way. Uh, just a couple more questions. Is Other than the mind thoughts, is there any supplements or specific foods that you should or should not eat that, sh that will change the, like, the chemistry of the blood in the prenatal period and the pregnancy that you know of randomly? Okay. Uh, it's a very important question because it also has to deal with the level of an individual's consciousness. Mm -hmm. I said, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. I say, there are people out there that don't eat any food really at all. They're called breatharians. And they do very, very well. And I go, well, they're not eating any of the, you know, like any food that we're eating. They're hardly eating anything at all. Right. Uh, and all of a sudden I say,
say, well, you got to have a, a mental attitude to, to, to do that and thrive doing that. If you don't have the right attitude, that can kill you right there. So uh, basically, it, it, it says that, uh, what food should I eat? And I go, what's your mental attitude? And I say, why? I say, if I, what's my picture? That's the first question. Am I building a picture of health or am I building a picture of fear? If I'm building a picture of fear, I'm not going to take healthy chemicals out of my food. Uh, back up, very important point. Just because you put something in your mouth and you swallow it, it's not in your body. It's not in your body for a simple reason. It's a pipe. <laughs> mouth at one end, anus at the other end, and intestine and all that. It's a pipe. I say, why is it relevant? Because the pipe is open at this end and the pipe is open at this end. What's the point? It's... It's not in the body. Anything that just went into the gut is in the pipe, but it's not in the body. It has to be transported out of the pipe, mm -hmm. across the wall of the pipe. So in other words, whatever's in my gut is not in my body because uh, I can have a bowel movement. Everything I just ate, it just came right back out again. It didn't affect me. So I say, well, then what's taken out of what I just ate? And I say, first you have a picture in your mind of what you're creating. And then the digestive system will remove from the digestive tract those elements necessary to create that image. Oh, so, my gosh. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So if you don't have a healthy image, and somebody says, yeah, but you should eat this healthy diet. I can say, well, it's fine. Eat the healthy diet. Guess what? Most of them just go right from one end and come out the other end. Okay? Uh, a, a very important point. This is this school because... Uh, down south in the U.S., we have uh, fundamentalists who work themselves up into what's called religious ecstasy, and they start speaking in tongues and being crazy like people. And some of them play with snakes. They're called snake handlers, and they play with poisonous snakes. With what? A belief that God will protect them. A belief of, I am safe, no question. And when they play with these poisonous snakes, even if they get bitten, usually it's not a problem, okay? But the ones that I want to talk about that connect to this story you just said, or some of them drink strychnine poison in toxic doses to prove that God protects them. So they drink this poison, and guess what? They're fine. They don't have, the they don't have the harmful effects. Why? Their belief system is so strong that that strychnine poison isn't taken in the body at all. It just goes out one end, out the other end. Uh, and the point was what? You could drink absolute poison and not get poison, but you better have the belief system for this. So, in other words, this, we eat food. We're going to make culture medium, blood. That's what we make from the food. The culture medium is nourishing the cells. Point is simply this. In my lab, I, I don't buy my ingredients at Kmart. I buy the best damn ingredients in the world to feed my cells. Why? If I compromise on the nutrition in that culture medium, in minutes I can see that they get sick. Okay? Now I'm telling a person, you're going to make blood. You're making nutrition. I said, but you're eating nutrition. I said, well, in that case, then damn well put in the best nutrition you could possibly put in there because even if your mind is not ready, if you don't have toxic stuff, at least you're not pulling toxic stuff out. Right. If your mind's, if your mind's not fully in harmony uh, and you eat toxic stuff, a lot of that stuff could be taken into the system to manifest a body that's not in harmony. That's the point. And so the issue is this. If I was uh, feeding... Uh, myself and I was carrying a child, well, then I would eat the best damn food that it's possible to eat. Yeah. I would eat clean food, organic food. I'd keep away from industrial farm food. I'd go organic as much as I could. Uh, why? Because even if I have negative thinking, I'm not at least putting in negative stuff that I would pull out of it. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and likely then, uh, just because I have positive thoughts, to be eating positive, which is a re reflection, I'm eating positive because I'm healthy, well then guess what? That thought alone will enable the healthy nutrition to come out of the system to nourish this child. So what a person eats is actually, bottom line, as we said with the strychnine, dependent on their belief system. Mm. That's what the point is. And since I... Most belief systems are not fully living in harmony and love and joy. Uh, then, in that case, until they are, then I would just make it a, a, a habit to eat the healthiest, best, non-toxic food that I can get. Organic. 
Do you think, so about food, I also want to talk about senses with you, like amplifying the sensory system. So in pregnancy or right before conception, you know, the sights, I mean, because we're talking about, you know, sights, but sounds and um, tastes and almost like creating almost a, a suedo, you know, perfected higher I mean, I, I believe the more I awaken and the more people awaken, the more my sensory system awakens. And, you know, the things are more beautiful, the way I perceive the world is. And how important is it for a woman to amplify the senses before she has a baby or while pregnant? The, the more joy and, and happiness and harmony she experiences, the more the chemistry of her blood reflects joy, happiness, and harmony. And if that's what the experience of the chemistry is, when it goes into the fetus, it's going to engage those characters of the child that match the food that just went in there, okay? Mm. So, so if she's happy, then the chemistry of her food, number one, is good, but then we also recognize this, the emotional chemistry that's also going in there is, a, is bringing happiness to the child as well in the chemical form through the, through the hormones and stuff like that. Uh, and happiness and harmony leads to health. And so it's uh, harmony, health, uh, disharmony, disease. <laughs> That's it's it's simple. It's really simple. That's exactly what it is. Is there anyone else doing this right now focused just on pregnancy? Like, I don't think I, I haven't found a book or a theory or anything that applies this type of knowledge to the pregnancy period. Have you? Yeah. Yeah. There's a, a, an organization called APPA, which is A-P-P-P-A-H. Three P's. A-P-P-P-A-H which stands for Association of Prenatal and Perinatal Psychology and Health. Okay. Uh, uh, prenatal and perinatal. Yeah. Uh, and and the website is, uh, uh, I think it's birthpsychology.com. Okay. Birth Psychology. But look under APA. Uh, and that's a, a whole resource. Oh, that's great to know. The information uh, for prenatal. Wonderful. And then the beginning, you mentioned mentioned um, the genom or er, I I mean I'll have it in the recording, but the the tribes. Is there any books on that and their programming for the child, or was that just sort of research that you found randomly? There, there's some research. I think it might be in my book Biology of Belief because I have a whole chapter. On yeah, it. I've read it. I'll, maybe I'll re look yeah. go back through it, it again. Have a, I think it might have a reference to genomic imprinting in there, and if not. Just look under a website, genomic imprinting. Okay. That is the term of selecting genes before the uh, fertilization process has even occurred. Genomic, so uh, an egg is already imprinted. A sperm is already imprinted. So when they come together, the, the imprints will, will coalesce and work together in some way, influence it. But it's exactly what you're talking about, uh, the story of genomic imprinting. When does it occur? Uh, before the egg is ovulated and before the sperm is released. This is when imprinting occurs. And then final question is, is there anyone else in the field that you know of that I could speak to that would, other than your expert self, on this that's talking about it with the, within the focus of pregnancy and, and, and con, or, you know, creating the moment of creating a child? And there's most uh, of them there. Okay. One of the, sci one of the scientists is Thomas Burney, B E R N Y or E Y, I can't B E R N, I think E Y, Thomas Burney. Uh, he, he is one of the founders of ABBA, and he's been doing this for years and years and years and years. And uh, But the members of that uh, ABBA board, you'll see there are MDs on there, and there are nurses, and there are psychologists, and you can find uh, a, a whole community that is built totally on programming uh, for the future uh, of a child. That's amazing. That's what the whole organization is about. So, uh, so many different names are involved in there. I'm so excited that you told me about that. I did not know that. Thank you so much for all this information. I learned so much and I am so grateful and all the women will receive this. And this is for Mystical Motherhood. So I really, really appreciate it. And you... I, I appreciate it, Chelsea, because the work you're doing to me is very profoundly important work. The idea is the health of the child when it comes to basically it. What we're always trying to do is fix the people who came in broken and then 
that spends a lot of time doing that is a lot more effective. Get them to come in healthy and whole. Right. And the world will change. The world will change. And, that, and that's what parents want. And, and parents also have to recognize something very, very, very important to me, the way I see it, and that's simply this. The future of this planet, the evolution that we're facing, is based on the people involved. It's people that are creating this evolution. And children are our best resource if we get them off the ground in a healthy, fully prepared, powerful way then they can change the world for us. And we, most of us, really have to go back and rework the damn programming that we received in those first years because 70% of the downloaded programs that occur uh, in that first period of life uh, are 70% are disempowering, self-sabotaging, and limiting behaviors. And that's why the public struggles. The public struggles not because nature won't give us things. The public struggles because our own programming is sabotaging us Subconscious means below awareness, and, and, and the issue is this: we have two minds. We have a conscious mind and a subconscious mind. People just say the mind. I go, no, no. There are two interdependent minds. Why? Each one has a different function, and each one learns in a different way. And this is where the problem comes from. The problem is this: there is the conscious mind, which is connected to our spirituality. It's the creative mind. Conscious is creative. So, it by definition. The conscious mind possesses your wishes and your desires. That's uh, because that's creative. I said, what do you want? He goes, I want to be healthy, happy, loved, with blah, blah, blah. I go, that's creative thinking. The subconscious mind is programs. It's just how to, how to behave. And I go, the first seven years of a child's life is when they're being programmed because the brain of a child is in a record mode to record behavior. It can't read a book. It, it, you know, I say, well, you want a child to learn how to be a functional member of a family and a functional member of a community. I said, well, then it has to learn a lot. I said, well, how are you going to teach a child the thousands and thousands of rules that constitute culture and family life? I go, you don't have to worry about teaching them because the first seven years of a child's life, their brain is primarily in theta. That's a lower vibration than consciousness. Consciousness kicks in around seven. The first seven years is downloading behavior that when consciousness does kick in, now there's some behavior to work with. If there's nothing in there and a child is conscious, they have nothing to be conscious of. So right. seven years of programming. And I go, well, this is really critical because this is where parents play a most instrumental part in how they're programming their child. They have to recognize that a child is literally recording everything they hear. And so... Uh, when parents that want to act like coaches, like, oh, you could do better, that's not good enough, you're not smart enough, you don't deserve that, stop crying, and they say things like that. They don't recognize that if a child's under seven, they're just directly recorded, whatever those words are. Right. And so uh, when a child starts to get in consciousness around seven, they're going to operate from those programs, and 70% and of those programs are disempowering and self-sabotaging. And that's because parents didn't realize that child is recording everything that you're saying and every behavior by just like a video recorder watching you. And those are the fundamental programs. And we were, re we were programmed by our parents. So, and, then, and then the issue is this. Only 5% of a normal life is controlled by conscious creative mind, meaning the wishes and desires mind, 5% is all we operate from in wishes and desires. 95% we are playing programs that we got in the first seven years. And most of those programs are self-sabotaging. Uh, and, and when we play them, we don't even see that we're playing them. That's called subconscious. Uh, uh, just to let people know why we play them is because the conscious mind with wishes and desires can control our behavior. But if it's thinking, then the conscious mind lets go of the control and goes inside. Thinking is an inside job. Mm -hmm. So when you're thinking, all behavior is automatically turned over to the subconscious as autopilot. And then, and now I, I'm going to give this number, and this is critical. 95% of the day, our conscious mind is thinking. Mm. Point. 95% of the day, we're playing programs that were downloaded into us by other people. And our, our conscious mind wasn't working when they were downloaded, so there was no filtering. Was this a good behavior or a bad behavior? It didn't make any difference. It was just downloaded anyway. And, and, and so
so I say, why is it relevant? Well, 95% of the day we're thinking, so our behavior is shifted automatically to subconscious, but the subconscious programs came from other people, don't answer our wishes and desires, and as a result, 95% of the day we, we are running our lives with programs that we don't even see because conscious mind's busy, and those, most of those programs are negative. And I say, what's the consequence? And we look at our life and go, God, life is a struggle. I'm really trying to get all these things, and I can't get them. And then we think that the universe is not providing for us. And it says, no, it had nothing to do with it. It was our own subconscious programs operating 95% of the day that sabotage us. Mm -hmm. So as conscious parents, the most important understanding for parents is you are programming this child even before it's born and for seven years. And this is not a new story. The Jesuits, for 400 years, have told people, give me a child until it is seven, and I will show you the man. Yeah. They've been telling people for 400 years, if I get the first seven years of your programming, 95% of your life is coming from the program. Yeah. Uh, and so your job is important, not only in the prenatal part, but in postnatal. Yeah. And attitudes and beliefs of the parents are picked up by the child who's recording. And, and if 95% of our behavior came from our parents and that wasn't any good, then what do you think the child's recording? <laughs> you know, here's another, just a simple nature about how the, the behavior is so prevalent to the genes. And it's this they follow the fate of babies adopted into families where there's cancer running in the family. Mm -hmm. And it turns out the adopted child will get the same family cancer as any of the natural siblings. Because of the belief, yeah. But they came from different genetics. Mm -hmm. The point, the cancer isn't genetics. The cancer is a result of the programming. And this is why prenatal, postnatal, conscious parenting is the only way to assure a future that civilization will be able to thrive into the future if we stop passing on these <laughs> disempowering and sabotaging beliefs that are unconsciously 95% of the day playing. Okay. Thank it's you. Important. It's so important. Thank you so and much. So that was my long tirade at the very end was only because I wanted to again emphasize how much I think your work is that important because until people wake up, they are victims of that belief that they were programmed with and so your work is vital in that let's change the programming before you have the baby yeah uh, don't pass this on anymore we need to pass something better yeah i completely agree i love my work great i'm glad you do because it's vital yeah thank you, very much. <laughs> thank you. have a nice day and good luck with everything you're doing on the planet and we all appreciate it so much thank you and i wish you the same for your work because i will Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye-bye, Bruce. Bye-bye.